The title of this message is Christian Living in the Home. Now the Apostle has told us, hasn't he, that Christians can't live the same way as other people. Christians live differently. He's told us in chapter 4, the first 16 verses, that when we're together as Christians, we behave differently from the way that unconverted people behave when they're together. Then from chapter 4, verse 17, to chapter 5, verse 21, he's told us that we behave differently when we're out in the world, generally. We spent two weeks looking at that. But now he's going to talk about the hardest place of all to live the Christian life. It's fairly easy to live the Christian life in church. It's a little bit harder to live it at work tomorrow or at school or in the School of Tropical Medicine or the university. But the hardest place of all to live the Christian life is home. So the Apostle comes to it last. So the theme of our passage is Christian living in the home. And if you look at the passage, chapter 5 verse 22 to chapter 6 verse 9, you'll see that it's quite a long passage and we really are going to do all of it this morning. That does not mean the message will be long. We're not going to miss the wood for the trees. We're going to extract out of this long paragraph the four most important things which need saying. It's far better to leave those bold lines in our mind than to be bogged down and lost in detail. The important thing is that when we leave this service, that we go home and we live the Christian life at home, according to the great principles of the word of God. The first point to make from this passage is the one I've already made. Christian friends, the Christian life has to be lived at home. First point, the Christian life has to be lived at home. Now I used to live in a house. But then I got married, and the house became a home. What makes a house into a home? A wife. The apostle wasn't married, but he had sufficient uh, nous to to know that it's a wife which makes a house into a home. So when he starts with Christian living in the home, he first of all addresses wives. So look at chapter 5, verse 22 to 24. That's all about wives, and there's a little bit more, just a little bit, at the end of verse 33. The apostle is saying to the Christian church, if your home is going to be the sort of home that God wants to see, you wives have got to be the sort of wives that God wants to see. Christian life has to be lived at home. Now, for a wife to be a wife, what must there be? Well, there must be a husband. Can't have wives without husbands. So from verse 25 to verse 33, the apostle addresses husbands. And he has more to say to them than to wives. In fact, he has more to say to them than any other group of people, for reasons which will become obvious. And again, we say it like this. If we're to have the sort of homes that God wants to see, we husbands have got to be the sort of husbands that God wants to see. A Christian life has got to be lived at home. Now in most cases, not all, but most cases, it's not long before the home is graced with children. So look at chapter 6 now, verses 1 to 3, and you'll see that the apostle now speaks to children. I ought to say that the children were in church when the apostle's letter arrived and he expected the children to be there to listen to his admonition. I hope you folk in the back there are listening on the intercom um, because I have a few words for those who are not actually in the service at the moment. They're behind there with the children. It's gone quiet over there. We ought to bring our children into the sermon as soon as we can. Obviously, when children are very young, prone to wander and squawk and do other things which children do, it may be in the interest of the whole congregation and that they go out. But when children come a little bit older and they're capable of listening to at least part of the message and grasping one or two points from it, then we ought to encourage them to be here. And the apostle expected the children to be present as he wrote his letter. 
Because if a home is going to be the sort of home that God wants to see, the children who are there have got to be the sort of children that God wants to see. Well, of course, if you have children, you have parents. The word parent is used in chapter 6, verse 1. But look at verse 4. The man up till now who has only been a husband is now a father. And the apostle speaks to fathers in chapter 6, verse 4. Now, why doesn't he speak to mothers as well? Well, the answer to that is obvious. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the man. The man, as we shall read in a minute, is the head of the wife. He's the head of the home. There is only one absolute authority in the home. It is the man. It is the husband. It is the father. He is the one who, at God's judgment seat, will be held accountable for the integrity of family life. Now, of course, mum has authority over the children, but she does not have an absolute authority. Her authority is only a delegated authority, an authority delegated to her by her husband. So when the husband isn't there, then you would expect the mum to act in the husband's place. But when the husband is there, you would not expect the mum to be assuming authority over the children, because the absolute authority is there. That's God's way, that's God's plan for the family. God the head of Christ, Christ the head of the man, man the head of the woman, and the father over the children, and the wife is the secondary authority over the children. But being not an absolute authority, the apostle does not speak to mums, he speaks to fathers, because the upbringing of children at the judgment seat will be held to be the responsibility of fathers. Well, that's the limit in most homes today, isn't it? Husband and wife, parents and children. But that wasn't the limit in the first century. There were other people living at home as well. So we look at verse 5, chapter 6, verse 5. You see, in the early church, there were also slaves. In fact, the vast majority of early Christians were from the slave class. Tens of thousands of the first Christians were slaves. Many of the finest Christian leaders and preachers of the early church were slaves. Well, it's not enough for them to live their Christian life in their few hours of liberty. They've got to be a certain sort of slave, a certain sort of servant back in the home. And the man of the house is wearing a third hat. If you look at chapter 6, verse 9. He's not only husband... He's not only father, but many, many of the men who Paul was addressing were also masters. Now I want you to note that he could still be a master and a Christian. We're not going to get sidetracked on this, but it ought to be noted that the Bible does not condemn slavery as such. The Bible strongly condemns man-stealing. Very strongly indeed. But the Bible does not condemn the holding of property in the life of another. And there was a certain sort of slavery, it was a voluntary slavery, but a certain sort of slavery actually permitted and regulations are given for it in the Old Testament. We're not going to get distracted by that and we're going to remember nonetheless that that slavery had very little, in fact it had almost nothing in common with the sort of slavery which operates in many pagan cultures today and the sort of slave trade which operated from Liverpool in the 18th century. The judgment of God was upon that. But nonetheless, many of those early Christians were masters. And they had to be a certain sort of master because the Christian life has to be lived at home. Now, it's supreme folly to take the servant master's passage and apply them to modern employer employee relations. Christian friends, believe me, and if you don't, uh, look hard at this passage, very hard indeed, the Apostle is not talking here about industrial relations. He's talking about the relationship of masters to slaves and slaves to masters in the context of the home. Now there are certain principles, no doubt, which can be extracted from the master-slave teaching, which apply to daily work today. 
but frankly there's very little in common between master-slave's relationship of the first century and you're going to work tomorrow and your relationship with your employer tomorrow. And it is folly just to, to take those verses right out of their context and to apply them to a situation for which they were never specifically intended. The theme of the apostle throughout the passage is Christian living in the home. Why? Well, there's an old proverb in English. He's a saint abroad, but a devil at home. And there are plenty of folk like that today. When they're with Christians, they're very plausible. Even at work, they take a fairly righteous stand. But when they come home, take off their slippers, and relax with all their defences down, in their own home, they're different creatures altogether. The Apostle will not allow, and the Word of God will not allow, any inconsistency between what I am in church, what I am in the wider world, and what I am at home. The Christian life has to be lived at home too. It's the hardest place of all. It's the place where we're best known and most misunderstood and most open to criticism. But that's where the Christian life has to be lived and it's a real test of you and the gospel. Because if the gospel is not capable of transforming the way you live at home, we have to conclude that the gospel is not capable of transforming people. And therefore any non-Christian living at home is in fact a shame upon the gospel. He whose light shines furthest, shines brightest, nearest, home. So our first point is that Christian life, the Christian life has to be lived at home. Now, point number two, and again we'll survey the passage to make it. Point number two is this. Not everyone at home has the same role. Not everyone at home has the same role. In this passage, Paul addresses each person at home separately with no overlap. Now, the only exception is the end of verse 33. Otherwise, there's no overlap between what he says to wives, husbands, parents, uh, children, fathers, servants, masters. He addresses each person in the home separately. Now, wives have certain privileges which they enjoy, which nobody else does, but the apostle doesn't talk about privileges. Children have all sorts of privileges which parents don't have, but the apostle doesn't talk about privileges. His theme isn't privileges. His theme is responsibilities. His theme isn't privileges. It's duties. And immediately that tells us something about how a Christian ticks at home. When a Christian puts his key into the door and lets himself in, he doesn't say to himself, what can I get out of family life? When a child gets out of bed in the morning, a Christian child, and comes downstairs, he or she doesn't say to himself, what can I get out of family life? The only question a Christian can ask is this one. What is expected of me at home? What is expected of me? And that's the whole difference between Christian living in the home and non-Christian living in the home. We're new people and we have to live in a new way. But notice what the question is. What is expected of me? What is expected of me? Because what is expected of a wife is not what is expected of a husband. What is expected of a child is not what is expected of a father. What is expected of a servant is not what is expected of a master. There are distinct, separate, decided, easily defined roles for each person in the house. Unfortunately, what usually happens is that we, come, we all the time are wondering about everybody else's performance. Instead of saying, I'm I, the husband that God wants me to be, we tend to say, is my wife the sort of wife God wants her to be? Instead of saying, am I the father that God wants me to be, we tend to say, my children are far away from what God wants them to be. The Apostle Paul won't have that. Each person has a, say, has a different role, a separate role, and we have to ask, what is expected of me? 
what is expected of me. Now in a minute, we're going to work through the passage more closely. This is what will happen in our sinful hearts. When I'm preaching about wives, all the wives will li- won't listen and they'll say it'll soon be his turn. And when I'm preaching about wives, the husbands will be thinking, hmm, she doesn't shape up very well, I'll have a chat with her when we get home. That's exactly the opposite of the apostle's way of approaching things. Each person has a separate role and what is expected of one is not expected of another. When we're preaching on wives, all the wives must ask, this is what is expected of me. Do I fulfill what God expects of me in the home? And when we come to husbands, children, fathers, the same question has to be asked. Family breakdown starts when we start criticising everybody else for their failures and stop examining ourselves in the light of God's word. So we've learnt two things. The Christian life has to be lived at home. Not everyone at home has the same role. So stop looking at others. Start looking at God's word. And in the light of God's word, let's put our own lives right first. Point number three. The role of each person is clearly defined. When you wake up tomorrow morning as a husband and you think of having breakfast with the family, you don't have to ask yourself, now what precisely does God expect of me in the family? It can be put in one word, as far as your relationship with your wife is concerned, and one word, as far as your relationship with your children is concerned. When you come in tomorrow and everybody else is at home, you don't have to ask yourself, what sort of of things are expected of me in the family? Because each one of our roles can be put in a word or two. There can be no confusion. God has made it so clear. God has given a key word to each member of the family. Look now at verse chapter 5, verse 22 to 24. What is the key word? The key word which sends a shudder down every feminist movement but which has been awfully misunderstood. Wives, says the Apostle, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You do it, voluntarily, but you do it. Or verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. What does that mean? Well, it means that the wife puts herself completely at the disposal of her husband. Everything that she is, everything, is for her husband. That includes, of course, her judgment, her intuition, her intellect, her gifts, everything. But nonetheless, there is all that she has and all that she is, and she submits to her husband. She says, here I am, here is what I am, here is what I have. And it's all for you. That's God's role for the wife. We can put it, therefore, in one word as the apostle does. Submit. Church of England wedding service uses the word obey. But the apostle doesn't. He uses the word submit for wives. Husbands, what's your key word? Well, look at verse 25 to 33. Your key word in verse 25 Love. Verse 28, love. Verse 33, love. Now, as you know, in the Greek language, there are lots of words for love. There's the word for lust. That's not the word used here. There's the word for friendship. That would be appropriate, but it's not strong enough for what the apostle has to say. He's going to use a greater word which includes that. He uses the word agape, which most people have heard of. It's the sort of love that Christ had for his church. It's a sacrificing love. It's a giving love. It's a love which lives for the welfare of the other. Whatever the personal pain, whatever the personal cost, however great the personal sacrifice. So the wife puts everything at the disposal of a man who will make any sacrifice for her good and her welfare and her benefit. That's the relationship of husbands to wives. 
His key word then is love. Tomorrow morning when the alarm goes off far too early, the wife must wake up and your opening word should be this, before you gaze across the pillow at him, submit. And his opening word, he should have beaten you to it. His opening word should have been in his mind, love. And that's how the day should start and end in a Christian home. Now about the children. Look at verse 1 of chapter 6. Children, obey. Some of you, of course, are children still and yet are of the age of majority. That's an enigma of our modern society. But children are children in the Bible until they marry. Therefore, the Bible uses the word honour because our relationship to our parents does change from complete obedience as toddlers, nonetheless to honour throughout the life. Honour is expressed in different ways. It's expressed in obedience with small children and expressed with thoughtful care and consideration and giving love in later life. But we'll keep the word obey for all that. The key word for children is obey. So you young people, the key word when you see dad walk through the door, when you see mum, is obey. That's the word. How about fathers? Chapter 6 verse 4. How could we give them a key word? Well, there's something they're told not to do. They're told not to exasperate their children. Sometimes the way fathers treat their children makes the child go mm, inside. It's never to happen in a Christian home. Instead, they're to be, you're to bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They're lovely words. What they mean is that everything which happens in the home and everything which is said in the home encourages the children towards Christ. There's a whole framework of life that are words spoken, words of reproof, it's a strong word, words of warning. There's a framework in the home, but the framework of it all is to direct the child towards Christ. How about the slaves? Well, if you look at their passage, chapter 6, verse 5 to 8, you'll see that what's required of them is consistent, good-natured obedience. Christ is my master, and I'll treat my earthly master like Christ. And what's required of masters? Chapter 6, verse 9. Well, you're over somebody, you're a master, but you're under somebody, you have a master. So your key word is answerability. Because just as your servants are answerable to you, you are answerable to your master in heaven. So, wives submit, husbands love, children obey, fathers encourage, servants obey as you obey Christ, masters answer ability. That's the key word. Now you think of the family where the key word is observed. She lives for him, he lives for her, that's what it amounts to. The children obey, the father never oversteps the line and makes his own impatience the, the excuse for his anger. The servants serve even their, even their ungodly masters like Christ. And the Christian masters, in all their relationships, remember that they themselves are answerable. What a lovely machine, sweet harmony would be in such a home as that. But the moment she starts living for him herself, putting herself first, the moment he starts thinking that that's too much to give, that's too much to do, it'll pain him too much and cost him too much, the moment the child says, I'm too old now to start obeying, and the moment the father starts disciplining the children simply because they're something that they want or do is inconvenient, and the moment the servant starts becoming rebellious, and the moment the master forgets that he's answerable, it only takes one of them to forget their key word, and the whole thing is spoiled. The Christian life has to be lived at home. Not everyone has the same role. The role of each person is clearly defined. Now we come to our last point. Important reasons are given for all these instructions. Important reasons are given for all these instructions. 
wives. Look at chapter 5, verse 22 to 24. Why should you submit? Well, it pleases the Lord. It's in accord with the divine pattern for the family, this pattern of headship. But the family is also intended to be a visual picture of something else. The relationship that the church has to Christ, that Christ has to the church. That's why wives must submit. Spiritual reasons, solid reasons, convincing reasons. Husbands, look at chapter 5, starting at verse 25 to the end. It's only by loving, sacrificially loving, only by caring for the spiritual advancement and progress and every other thing of your wife that the visual picture will be preserved. Besides, says the apostle, you're not two anymore, you're one. And the way you treat your wife is the way in the end you're treating yourself. So love her as yourself. You can't behave as if she's something separate from you. God has made the two one as surely as he's made the, the church of Christian believers one with Christ. You see, the family is intended to be a visual picture of the relationship of the Saviour to his church and the church to the Saviour. People should be able to come into Christian homes and catch a little of the spirit of the relationship which believers have to Christ by the relationship of husband to wife and wife to husband. How about children? What strong reasons are given to children to obey? Well, young people, look at verse 1 carefully. I used to think it read like this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord when they're right. That's not what it says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. And then two verses follow which make it plain that God promises to bless obedience. And he always has done. Obedient children are always happy, aren't they? Always. Because the, all the responsibilities which they would otherwise carry are on their parents' shoulders. And their responsibility is simply to obey their parents and not shoulder those responsibilities for themselves. Obedient children, obedient teenagers, are always free. Because when the parents say to John, come in at half past ten, and he does... And when they say, come in at 9.15, although he thinks it's unreasonable, he does, they trust him. And once you've got the spirit of trust, they, John finds to his amazement that he's been giving more and more freedom because his parents actually trust him. And the way for children to get freedom is not to kick, kick, kick against mum and dad, but to obey. And they finally get it. God blesses obedience. People, young people who obey grow up, you know. Some young people are only b bothered about growing up in their body. Poor people. Some are only bothered about growing up in their mind. That's a little bit better. But you Christian young people, you should be bothered about growing up spiritually. And obedience is part of God's discipline for growing up spiritually. A discipline which Jesus himself submitted to. In fact, it is a f obedient young people are always strong. Always. I'll explain to you why. It's a little bit of an aside, but I'll explain to you why. This young person doesn't want to do what his parents say, but he does it. Because there is a God-ordained authority telling him to do it. Everything inside him says no, but he does it. And eventually he becomes a person who submits to God-ordained authority. And he does things, not because the fancy takes him, but on the ground of principle. When he grows older and he's no longer under the shadow of his parents, he doesn't do things because a fancy takes him, or doesn't take him, but on the ground that it's right. And he has a strong character. Weak character is always linked to disobedience. In fact, every army officer in the world, whatever army, knows that the only person who can lead is the person who first of all has learned to obey. The centurion knew that in the Bible. I am a man also under authority, he said, so I say to this man, go and he goes, come and he comes. His very power to command came from the fact that he was obedient, same as Jesus became the captain of our salvation, only by becoming obedient 
through suffering. Well, parents, what reasons are given to you? Chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers. Well, there are no reasons given. In Colossians, the apostle says, don't treat your children badly because they might become discouraged. But we could give a lot of reasons why parents shouldn't provoke their children and should encourage them. But the greatest reason is this. God has instituted the world in such a way that the greatest single influence on a child's life is the parents. Teachers have an influence, neighbours have an influence, the peer group has an influence, but nobody, nobody, nobody has an influence like the parents. And if the father does his job properly, nobody like the father. And God has commissioned to parents, to mum and dad, the formation of a character. That is a high calling, and there are very few higher, if any, callings in the world. It's amazing how parenthood is despised in the modern world and how the training of children's character is regarded as, as something secondary and belittling. Servants, Christ is your real master. Masters, you're under Christ. Principles for every member of the family and every person who ever lives. Although intended originally distinctly for certain people in the home. Well, we've learned four things and we'll underline them. The Christian life has to be lived not only in church and in the world, but at home. Each person in the home has a different role. No person has the same role. The role of each person is clearly defined. Strong reasons are given as to why we should behave in that particular way. When God created the world, friends, he set up three institutions. The family, then eventually the state, and at last the church. He set up the family first. God's very jealous for family life. Family life is a holy thing, it's a sanctified thing, and the Bible spends a lot of time talking about it. What disgrace is brought on the gospel if Christians live badly in the family? One of the encouraging things about three of the young people who are going to be baptised this evening is that their parents said, he, she, has changed at home. That's proof, you know, like nothing else, of a real change in a person. If you can't make spiritual progress in the context of Christian living in the home, where, pray, can you do it? It's the hardest place, your guards are down, your defences are down, there's no time off in the home, you can leave work behind. There's no escape in the home, people see us as we really are. The devil attacks us there like he attacks nowhere else. It's the place of our worst failures and our unwisest words. And it's the place where we must work the hardest to live the Christian life. Well, friends, it's no mistake then, is it, with such difficulty that the apostle goes straight from the Christian home to talking about the spiritual warfare. Don't miss next week's thrilling instalment.